Hey, Sword fans. I thought it's time for another unboxing video, though uh, I've already unboxed these and they are right here in front of me. So it's just to show what I have acquired in the last month or so of gathering bits and bobs. Quite a lot of it came from the Kempton Arms Fair and they are some fun pieces. So I am going to start with the lowest value going up to the highest value, roughly. Um, so the first bits will be a bit more common, a little bit less wild, and then we can get progressively more weird and impressive the more we go. So starting out, whilst this is technically a sword channel, I do enjoy um, items used for policing uh, in history. So first off, I have this. This is uh, a wrist restraint affectionately known as a come along. And it's uh, quite fun. It is used to, let me break that open, put around the wrist. You put that behind someone and then if someone is being a little bit rowdy, you can just yank their wrist and pull it up behind their head until their eyeballs want to shoot out of their face. And your, not victim, maybe victim, but uh, prisoner, let's say, will uh, very quickly become compliant. So I'm not sure if I'm going to keep these because I've had a few pair of these before. This is the oldest set I've found. This is the first model Hyatt um, come along that I've had. Uh, all the ones that I've had are like third or fourth variant. But these are the originals, which is quite fun. These are, as you can see, quite chunky and they have a break open there so you can get someone's wrist in and very hefty lock so once it's locked in that ain't coming off it's not my usual thing but i thought i would grab it i saw it and i instantly fell slightly in love with it i don't know what that says about me but it's a fun piece moving on this is the first ethnographic piece this is a somali Belau. These are the knives to short swords, because these can be very large, that uh, were used by the Somali people. And they're still used today. I don't collect the more modern ones, because they're still being made. This one is late 19th century, most likely. Uh, maybe as late as 1910, but there is a fair amount of decent weathering on the blade. And it is of a style used in the 19th century. These are very light and whippy in the hand. The uh, blade is quite thin, as you can see there. Has two very wide fullers and handles a little bit like a bowie knife. Uh, as you can see, it has a almost clipped back there. And in combat situations, would be used in conjunction with these bucklers, which, uh, yeah, fun. This, uh, I already have one in my personal collection, so this one will be going straight up for sale. Uh, that buckler is my in my personal collection, but I do have another one that I will be putting up for sale soon. Next on, we're staying in Africa, but we are moving to Ethiopia. This is an Ethiopian scythe. This is not one of the rhino horned ones. This is hide over wood on the hilt. And it has the triple fullered, most likely German blade. Quite, well, not very flexible, but it has some flex. It's very light. It is a short cut and thrust sword that was used by the Ethiopian soldiers this one is most likely, again, late uh, 19th century, so this is uh, the 
sort of saw that would have been used in the attempted uh, colonization of Ethiopia by the Italians and the uh, battles fought against the British um, in the late colonial period. Next up is not something you see on my side very often, it's a Masonic sword. I don't usually like these, but I found one that was quite nice. It is in essentially mint condition and it comes with its full belt and frog set. So I got offered that at a price I couldn't refuse. And yeah, it just spoke to me a little bit because it's in great shape. It still has the really rather wonderful locket you find on British military swords. And they have the maker's mark. Uh, yes, it was made by Toy Kenning and Spencer. So it was made by an outfitter and regalia maker. And the blade is most likely a Wilkinson uh, from the late 19th century to the first 10, 15 years of the 20th. Uh, I do have another one in my personal collection, which is a bit more fun. It's this skull topped one with the uh, crossbone um, creance. Quite nice. Not a, This one's in better shape, but this one will be staying with me for a long time until I upgrade it. Now, everything from here on out is a military sword of some sort or of the age when civilian swords would have been used by the military. Uh, next up, well, let's stick with this one. Another little pickup. Uh, this one I got on a whim. This didn't speak to me the first few times I've seen it, but I saw it again and I just thought, why not? It's something that I've never owned before. This is the M1929 Italian Officer's Sword. So it has all the features you'd expect on an Italian sword. It has the little thumb section there, so you don't get your fingernails smashed in if the guard ever gets hit. Quite a thin guard with a cutout section in the shape of a teardrop. It has that wonderful clip point that you only really see on Italian swords uh, regularly. And I am a sucker for a clip point on a sword. They are just fun. This one is not very common because by the time these were being made, swords were pretty much obsolete in the military. They're, they were carried in World War II. I don't know how sure the reports of them being used are. Uh, I feel like it may be the odd overzealous officer waving around his sword whilst shooting with a pistol. But apparently these were used, and as a fun fact, these are the only Art Deco military sword on Earth. So, never had one. It will be going up on the site, it will be going up for sale. It's just a fun bit of history. And quite nice, it's in essentially mint condition, aside from two little spots on the plating. Next up is a something that I, I love getting these in, but they never last long. So I picked this up because it's just in perfect shape. A Chinese Yundao. This one is late 19th century up to about the Boxer Rebellion period. And I picked it up because it has essentially, let me try, there we go essentially a mint condition scabbard. It does have one section there that has broken. It would have originally looked like that. But the leather work is complete. The iron work is complete. The stitching is still all there. And usually these don't come with scabbards. So finding one in sh this good a shape is great. These are cleavers. Uh, they are very simple swords. They are, they have a point, but they are cutters. This is a butcher's blade and it will just cleave. They are fun and they 
don't come up insanely often. They, they, a lot were brought back to the UK after the Boxer Rebellion as bringbacks. And yeah, they're just interesting swords. This one has the standard hollow pommel. It does have a bit of bronzing, so I'm not sure if that's decoration or structural. It has its hollow disc guard. It has its original wrap, which also you don't see very often. So it's a cord wrap around a wood core. And yeah, it's just in great shape. Not something that you see often. What's next? Okay, let's go to India next. So this is one of my favorite swords. I've had two, three dozen of these. Uh, I used to keep one in my collection permanently. Now I've replaced it with something slightly nicer. Um, well, not nicer, rarer in my Anglo-Indian Cavalry Sword collection. This is the Indian 3-bar based on a mix of the Paget and 1796 blade and the 3-bar hilt of the Light Cavalry. These swords were carried from about the mid-19th century through to World War II by Indian and Anglo-Indian soldiers. These are almost purely cavalry swords. They feel great. They are, in my mind, what the 1796 should have been. Nice half basket, big cutty blade. This one has an attempt at making a point. It is sharpened on both edges and still quite sharp. I cut myself on this when I was on, uh, unpacking it. It doesn't have any maker's marks and has a tulwar blade rather than one of the British made ones. This one is quite an early version and it has one of its rarer leather cover scabbards, which they don't come up all the time. These more often get seen naked. This is a fun sword. Again, it's a bit of a cheap and cheerful. They are less expensive than an 1821, but more expensive than um, a 1796 without a scabbard. They are low to mid-range swords. And yeah, I think every British sword collection should have one. Now, for a purely Indian sword, an late 18th century Kora. This is the sword related to the cookery from North India. This one is a nice example. It isn't one of the ones covered in gold, but it has a fighting blade rather than the ones covered in decoration, which were usually hunting or temple swords. And this one has the remains of silver on the hilt, which is quite nice. It's a good little fighting weapon from the last couple of decades of the 18th century. And these were, well, they're still used now for uh, certain temple rituals, but these were fighting weapons and it's quite nice to see one that is forward curving. This one is completely solid in the hilt and just feels good. Now, moving on to the swords that I am slightly obsessed about. First off, we have this. This looks like a hanger or a very early saber. And it is. The fun bit about it is that it's very early. The Royal Armouries have one of these and they've dated theirs at about 1650. It's an all iron with faceted uh, cow horn grip. The blade is double marked with the man in the moon. And the reason I got this is I have two. And they are almost exactly alike, aside from this one has a knuckle bow and a clamshell. So now I have the simple S guard and it has these wonderful apple finials on the end of the S guard. Same finial that you see on the end of this. 
and it's nice to have one very rare sword. It's better to have two. Now for one that uh, I've had quite a few requests about because I forgot that this was in a picture I shared. So, starting off here, this is an 1803 hilt. This is the flank officer's sword. These were used often by soldiers who are more likely to see combat. This one is really nice. And these were famously one of the curviest swords the British ever used. So. <laughs> this is a broadsword bladed 1803. And it's likely an heirloom blade, 18th century, uh, maybe a touch earlier, but I have a feeling that this is late 18th century, Scottish rather than English. And yeah, it's just a fun piece. Had to pick it up. It's so me that the dealer who had it kept it for me because he knew I would love it. This will be getting its own video at some point, just so I can explain how fun it is, how rare it is, the handling of it. And yeah, fun little bit. Next up is a kind of sword that I, I've been looking for one of these for a while. This isn't my ideal one, but I just wanted to have it. This is a colonial era Espada Ancha. These are the Spanish swords used by the Spanish military and the civilians who went to um, South America. This one is uh, marked to the Toledo Dragoons and the blade is marked 1740. And that's the reign of Carlos III. It is also marked on the blade to Carlos III. And there. Dragones Toledo 1740. This is fun. So these blades are a bit mad. Not many of them are the same. This one has the same cup you would find on a late rapier or early small sword. And it has a half basket with a thumb bar and three bars over the front, including a knuckle bow. And it's just really fun. It is a Spanish style broadsword. And you don't see many of these in the UK, so I may hold on to this for a while, but it will be going up for sale at some point. If you want a mid-18th century Spanish sword, let me know. You can go on the top of the list to be offered it when it goes up for sale. Moving on to the last three swords now. Firstly... There is this wonderful thing. This is a Persian scythe. Uh, this is Qajar dynasty. I would say this one is likely circa 1800, not really any earlier than that. Uh, I will be able to figure out a bit more because it is signed. The cartouche is there and it has the lion and son of the Qajar dynasty. Underneath that is what makes this interesting though, aside from the funky blade. This has the remains of the parasol, which means it is most likely a sword that was in the royal household or gifted by the royal household. I would guess gifted because this sword has a nimcha hilt, which is what you would expect on a North African piece rather than a Persian Iranian piece. This scythe is really fun. It has a double fuller, it has Arabic script there, gilt inlay, the parasol marking there, or what remains of it. Sadly, it has been polished a touch, and it has a serrated blade. Some of this, like just there, there is a serration that's damaged, which suggests it may have been used. Uh, though with all sorts, can't confirm, but it has nice, even, professionally done serrations, the rest of the blade. It's mad, it's fun, I got it from one of my favourite dealers, and I walked away from it, and had to go back about five minutes later. Uh, this one will be going up for sale pretty much straight away. 
Okay, the penultimate sword. This is one I'm really excited to have. It is a sword that I affectionately call the Hope Small Sword, mainly because it appears prominently in the uh, fencing manual of Sir William Hope, who was a broadsword and small sword teacher. He lived from 1660 to 1721. And this is a transitional rapier, just in the style of what we see in Hope's books. It has a longer than average blade for a small sword. It has these really quite large and crisp um, crossbars on the cross hilt. It has a likely German made blade. It has the Mont Damasco there, which is Spanish for Damascus. And it has a pattern welded and edge hardened blade. Uh, there are pictures up on Instagram of it, and when this sword gets photographed for sale, if I can bring myself to sell it, there will be pictures of a wonderfully edge-hardened Damascus blade with a nice snaking line all the way down each side of the blade. It's also really... the it moves well. It has a fuller, essentially, until the tip. It stops there. And, yeah, standard what you would accept on, uh, expect on a transitional rapier blade. Wire-wrapped hilt, Turk's heads, and a large rapier pommel to counterbalance that longer blade. Okay, now for the last sword. This one I picked up because I kind of recognised it and it was driving me a bit mad. I picked it up at the end of an arm set after being there for five hours. This was still there and my curiosity drove me a bit mad. This is a sword likely made by the same man who made Katana. Not Katana, Katana. The Coronation Sword of England. The man's name was Robert South. He was the cutler to the king, and the sword was made in the reign of King Charles I, not the current one. And originally, this would have had a gilt hilt with silver. The silver remained, the gilt has sadly gone, and it is in the form of what we would now call a pillow sword. These cross hilts came back into popularity after they started being carried by members of the Order of the Bath. But this is a fully functional weapon. This feels great. It has a double-edged broadsword blade. It has the remains of a point which has been lost at some point, most likely due to the corrosion it has suffered. There are three other examples of these that exist that I know of. One is in the VNA, that is a confirmed Robert South with the exact same hilt, slightly larger pommel. There's one in the Wallace collection and one in the um, Hermitage Museum in St. Petersburg. This sword, I did not know what it was when I picked it up, I just knew I recognized it from a book. I went slightly mad after I figured out what it is. It's a great sword, a great piece, and a one-of-a-kind for a collector, because who knows if there are any more out there. Well, thank you for watching, and uh, this has been my first unboxing or show and tell of the year. I will be making extra videos on some of these pieces. Thank you very much. Take it easy, guys.